Okay, good afternoon everyone. I'm happy to see all of you here to talk about economic models. Uh, today we have a panel to discuss the future models of today and how to change them so they would be future proof. Uh, we have uh, four very lovely experts here today to help me out in this discussion. So before we um, start off a bit of introduction of the topic and the experts and then we will get going. So this uh, discussion is organized by the Nordic Ministers Council and uh, the reason why we are discussing this topic is that it's very clear that we cannot go on as we have. The idea that uh, the economy can grow to some infinite point is not realistic. There's an issue of resources, both um, demographic and both natural resources. So we will try to figure out how to build a better and more equal model for everyone. And to help me out for this discussion, we have four experts. So quickly to introduce you on what it is that you do on a daily basis. So starting from uh, that then, Christina, you're the head of Responsible Business Forum. So what is it that you do on a daily basis? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, basically, uh, we are a network of businesses, uh, which I'm guiding. And, and our main aim is to create an environment uh, where businesses can actually discuss what responsible business means. Uh, be because responsibility as ethics is uh, all the time developing topic. It's not fixed, it's, it, it consists of, of many things. And uh, through organizing events and responsible business index, we, uh, we create tools and opportunities for companies to participate. Mm -hmm. So our next expert is uh, from uh, Finland. Mika, you're an economist and a futurist. So what does a futurist do on a daily basis? Well, on the da data, or daily, I'm, I'm nowadays working on social media, how people are sort of seeing the world. But, but the reason probably I am here, I, I wrote some 20 years ago an article which was sustainable consumption. So consumption studies is, is my, my main, main area nowadays. Hmm? Uh, Thea, you're the head of Foresight Center at Riigikogu. So what does the Foresight Center do? Uh, <coughs> Good afternoon. The Foresight Centre is also looking into the future. Uh, we do have a Foresight Act in Estonia. Perhaps not all of you are familiar to that fact. And uh, the Foresight Act says that the Foresight Centre is to uh, develop scenarios uh, looking um, 5 to 15 years into the future at least. They can be of longer perspective, but uh, at least. And we are located uh, uh, next to the parliament. So uh, the parliament members are our main uh, uh, clientele, our target group. So we, we try to be helpful uh, to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mikael, who is sitting next to me, is from Sweden. And you're uh, a researcher at the Swedish Environment Research Center. So on a daily basis, what do you do? Yeah, well, I'm also an economist, and uh, some of the things I'm doing is, uh, for example, I've been involved in a project called Beyond GDP Growth, where we developed a number of scenarios for 2050. It was Swedish, the Swe how the Swedish society could develop without growth, what would happen without growth. So I'm actually very interested in the economic system and how it could be organized differently. Mm -hmm. So we will try to go through three parts in this discussion. Firstly, to understand how we came to this problem, where we are right now, and what were the issues and what should we be worried about. And to end on a positive note, we will also try to solve this problem. Let's see how uh, well we do. Um, so firstly, to kind of define the problem, um, Mika, can you help us out? What is the problem with the current economic model? I, I, I think for quite a long time <coughs> in European <coughs> countries, it has been that the, the, the growth uh, economy, it is manifested in consumers' life in, in three, three different ways. One is what has happened to food economy, there's more and more energy putting into the food system. And secondly, what's happening for the traffic. In Finland, for instance, in the 1950s, people were moving on, on a daily basis some eight kilometers. Nowadays, it's 40 kilometers. It's one of these kind of everyday life grow, growth uh, phenomenon. And then, then, of course, there is the housing, which is the th third biggest area which we should sort of focus on. It's nowadays, in, in 1950s, fin Finland, we have about an average people, they have uh, 
some 10 uh, square meters per year. It's now it's about over 40 square meters. So I, I think that instead of only focusing on GNP and economic growth, we should also focus on the growth of, of ordinary people life and what's happening there. And so in Finland, for instance, nowadays, people still think that we need bigger, bigger houses. I, I think if, if we are really sort of conscious about environment, we should discuss about getting smaller houses instead of bigger houses. Mm. Uh, Christina, you're mostly in contact with business people. Do they sense this problem as well, that capitalism as is does not really work anymore? I can comment based on my practice. It's uh, four and a half years so far. And uh, in large, I can tell you there are two types of managers, very large generalization. There are those who ask, uh, where's the profit for me when I do responsible business? And the others who, who basically sense they have a gut feeling that it's the right way to go. Um, so uh, I see that some are forced to think that it's a problem and some sense it's a problem because they uh, realize within this uh, very, very tense uh, comp competitive world that it's difficult for, th for them to stay human. And then, are, then there are others who are still like in this robotic mode and they just do uh, what they were told and how they were maybe raised and taught at schools. So. I think, uh, yes, there are a lot of people who sense it and feel it within their everyday lives and those who uh, have learned it and those who, of course, deny it also. So there are different managers. Mm -hmm. uh, Mika, can you give us a bit of background if, if we look at the current economic system? What are the biggest impacts environment-wise, consumption-wise? What, what are the numbers or statistics that we are seeing that we should be very, very worried about? Well, you can express it in many ways, but, but one way of saying is that we're, we're living as we had more than one planet. I think uh, in Sweden we say that we live like we, I mean the average Swede, if everyone lived like the average Swede, then we would need like three or four planets. And I think Estonia is not much far behind. So actually we're, we're consuming the planet. I mean, we're pr consuming more than the planet is producing. And I think, um, I mean, <coughs> there is, this is really to do with the activities we do. I mean, all activities that we are doing have some footprint. Of course, some activities are, are more problematic than others. But I mean, if you spend an hour in a car, you make more you you, you uh, make more problems to the planet than if you're sitting in a theater or if you're sitting and listening here. But actually, all activities have some environmental footprint. So what we need to think and what we need to understand is that it's the it's the total volume of production which is and consumption is, which is too big. It's not only some activities, I think everything. It, it's just that we have become so affluent that we have, I mean, we have over, over we, we're over consuming and it has, I mean, hmm? you can speak for long about that, but. Hmm. Uh, yeah, has the Foresight uh, team ended up with the same uh, view that we are over consuming and we don't have enough resources? Uh, partly. Mm. We haven't tackled this issue um, specifically, uh, but um, mm, how it uh, actually uh, seems to be based on uh, what we have uh, researched. Mm, the root cause of consumerism is, of course, uh, the, the capitalist economic model that uh, has proven to be, uh, has yielded uh, great results in terms of uh, taking a lot of people out of poverty and increasing living standards. But uh, it seems that uh, uh, the rules and the regulations are not yet there, um, uh, not enough there. Uh, and. Uh, Capitalism, how it works, is that it uh, reacts to uh, price mechanisms. That if something uh, has a price, then uh, uh, it can be included into um, uh, in, in, into the, the, the budgets and investment decisions. But um, uh, environmental goods and services uh, do not have a price, or then have a rather low price. That's of course the reason why why, for example, the Euro European Union has started to to uh, um, to price carbon. Uh, so, uh, but there's a lot of things that are not yet priced, and even the price of carbon is claimed to be too low still already. Uh, we, although um, Estonian uh, oil shale companies are already in difficulties due to that. Mm, 
Mm, uh, so, uh, if uh, the components of uh, natural capital, uh, like for example uh, climate change, biodiversity, if they are not adequately priced, then uh, what comes out is a so-called negative externality, as, as business uh, people call it, meaning that there is overusage of that particular kind of, uh, of, of input or, or over uh, polluting uh, because it is not enough uh, taken into account in the investment decisions. It's not priced correctly. So um, mm, uh, it still seems that the capitalism is in uh, partly uh, in infant years. It's, it's uh, a little bit still uh, as a wild west and it needs to be uh, uh, it needs to have more regulations uh, in terms of pricing uh, the, the environmental goods and services correctly so we could really take them into account. Of course, there's a lot of problems that arise at the same time, but that's perhaps a different story, and I, I can come to this later. Mm -hmm. So we've mentioned many things. We've mentioned uh, wasting resources or consumerism. So people generally like assigning blame to someone. So my question is that we, we kind of have three components here. We have the consumers who are consuming all the products. We have the businesses who are producing these products. And then we have the government who is regulating the system. So out of the three, who is to blame? All of them. All of them. <laughs> well, the human nature, I would, I would say. No, I think the, 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 the nature mic. of the of the companies as well. Sorry. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'll just come back to this, uh, mm, the definition of capitalism, perhaps we don't think about it so often. It is basically uh, production in private hands for profit. And uh, this uh, strive for profit is, uh, has induced the consumerism, because it is, uh, of course, uh, profitable if we do... Uh, buy new things uh, whenever we think that we are bored with old ones, uh, even if they are not broken or not out of use. So, um, uh, and this is, uh, however, uh, this strive for profit is also stimulus for investment, including investment into cleaner technologies, investment into uh, repairing the degradation to, to environment. So it's a two-edged sword, uh, but, but this is the main cause um, of, uh, of uh, consumerism, the strive for profit. Christina, if, if you look at uh, companies, um, are they self-motivated to do better or do you feel that the government should interfere with y external motivation? You mean produce less? Yes, or more sustainably. Oh, okay, I, I, st I start with the first question you asked. I think that nobody's to blame because we as a society, we have supported this kind of uh, way of behaviour for years, decades. So we have grown in the society where we got uh, rewarded for uh, doing quantity in business, maybe not so much, much quality. We have to look at the past and take it into consideration and therefore we have to start solving the problems if we consider them to be problems from the viewpoint we have right now. We have these corporations, we have this kind of society, we have rewarded that. So what will we reform from now on uh, and, and what should we redefine? What's the quality of life? Uh, does every one of us uh, know what the quality is for you and, and what you are buying uh, tomorrow and today? Uh, so I think that every business leader is actually a human being thinking the same way. I was rewarded for years for growing this corporation. Who's to blame? Uh, you are buying from me. Who's to blame? So it, it's basically a collective decision if we want a big shift. It's not one sector uh, because it's all people who are working and managing these companies. So we, we basically actually would, would go back to education system where we learn to cooperate and learn to see common values. Not everyone for themselves, but how to create so that everyone wins. And there are examples uh, uh, for, from, from young entrepreneurs like uh, uh, Rivers Resources, who uh, which was uh, brought to life by Anne Brunnell. Um, I wrote it down actually that uh, she has built a, a platform which brings together brands, suppliers, traders and recyclers uh, to make uh, decisions that, uh, that is a win-win for everyone. So teach corporation managed, uh, managers to think this way. Uh, that's a task for you to think how possible is it if they're already grown up and they have fixed uh, ways of thinking based on where they've grown. So I don't think they're to blame. I think uh, it's for us to take a challenge and see if they can, can, can be convinced and educated to think behalf of the collective, not only for themselves. Mm. Mika. 
I, I don't think it's reasonable to think about who to blame, but uh, one thing I, I'm quite uh, convinced is that there is no green consumers at all. And I, I think we are in such a hurry to make a decision to save the planet. Consumers are changing their habits very, very slowly. And these radical changes which would be needed if, if the planet should be saved, is, for instance, uh, decreasing the quality of uh, hygienic uh, going to shower only once a week or, or, or giving up cars or, or these are so radical things that, that at least in Finland there is no, nobody, maybe some few people who are making these radical changes. I, I believe more in, about in regulation and price mechanism. Okay, but let's check with the audience. The first question, would you be willing to completely give up traveling by car? Raise your hand. <coughs> If there is public transportation, yeah. yes. You don't have to walk from Baida to Tainan. We came by bus. You came by bus, okay. <laughs> the second question, would you be willing to only shower once a week to save the planet? <laughs> okay, a few hands here. Uh, but yeah, Mika, my question for you was yeah. going to be, yeah. do you see consumers changing their behavior? Because right now we have, uh, we have many kind of these ideas, the concept of circular economy, we have uh, uh, recycling as a priority. Um, is, are those just buzzwords or are those actually happening and, and influencing our footprint? I, I think consumers can change their beha behavior if it's, if it's very convenient, very easy to find alternative traffic f systems, for instance. But otherwise, no. And in Finland, those who say they are green consumers who vote for Green Party, they are typically those people who are m using most energy. They are living in the city and they typically have cars and all these things. So, so in Finland, we do not have these green consumers. But maybe in Sweden, the <laughs> thing is different. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so first is Sweden, then Estonia. <laughs> Do you have green consumers? No, we don't. And I, <laughs> I think the, the problem is that, I mean, if you have money, you spend them. You can, you can say that, okay, I'm not going to spend it on something, but then you're going to spend it on something else. And in the end, it will, the, the money will circulate and it will end up destroying the planet. So I think we need some kind of... <laughs> regulation for for ha us having less money i mean those i mean <laughs> <laughs> i think they're called it, it, it's very unequally <laughs> distributed so i'm not saying that everyone should have less but you know you, you understand what i mean we, we're as a, as a, as a society we're too affluent hmm? tax okay tax yeah I, i'll give my turn yeah. to kaupo he wants to okay okay yeah could, could you have microphone uh, could you send the microphone please uh, a man named uh, Penti Linkola uh, constructed uh, in 19, uh, I think it was 1989, uh, a special way for Finland uh, to, to make it uh, possible to, to yeah. live forever. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, what do you think yeah. about it? He, he, it, he, it, it is yeah. unrealistic. Yeah. Uh, very, very unrealistic when uh, he's getting sick, he going to hospitals. Uh, he uh, now could be go just by himself fishing, but still uh, his background, he's in educated in Finnish school systems, all these things. I, uh, I really think it's very unrealistic nowadays to have, but that's true. He is the one guy in Finland who is known being a green, really green, but he's also, his many ideas there are very fascistic ideas about killing people because well, there's, there's too many people. And so I, I don't like his, uh, his kind of way of argument. Yeah. <laughs> He's gone too far. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay but uh, I wanted Estonia. to add to, uh, to this, uh, mm, uh, that whether it's uh, only the convenience that triggers us to consume uh, that much, uh, I doubt it. Uh, I would add that uh, as long as consuming a high rate of consumption is, uh, is uh, mm, a sign of status, of social status, uh, as long nothing changes. So uh, we need to somehow um, mm, break the connection between high social status and, uh, and high rate and high level of consumption. So to be satisfied with less should not be a shameful thing, but an honorable thing. I don't know how to get there, but it's a, it's a question, uh, perhaps some more research should be done in that issue. But there's of course uh, mm, uh, a small, hope on the horizon as well, because it seems to be that the younger generations, so the ones who are mm, teenagers today, 
uh, they um, seem to be more climate-minded, more environment-minded, and less obsessed, uh, obsessed with owning things. So one of the, okay, we'll come to the solutions probably later, but um, quite many youngsters, uh, they don't need to uh, own a car, but uh, if they want to um, experience uh, a ride, so they, they uh, call a taxi or a ride sharer. Uh, so, and, and in different uh, fields of life, actually, in order to get uh, the consuming experience, you don't have to, have to own the thing anymore. And if you get to this point, it changes a lot of uh, economic models and a lot of uh, implications uh, to the use of materials, resources, and, and to the pollution as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Mikael, when you, when you look at the regular person's consumption, what are the things that actually leave the biggest footprint? Because quite often we're focused on things, small things like are we using plastic straws or, or how are the items that we are consuming uh, packaged? But I read a statistic that you can be as green as you want, but if you take one flight to your warm destination holiday a year, that cancels it out, absolutely. Yeah, that's true. I mean, uh, Usually, I mean, that, that's the perfect example. If you, if you take a flight, then you spoil everything else. I mean, it's if you... But, but also meat consumption, if we talk about climate. But I think, I mean, yeah, those are the I mean, transports. I think the ones that Mika uh, mentioned is the most important. But I think, actually, we should count everything. But, but of course, you, you couldn't just like, okay, I, I bought some eco label product. Now I can go to Thailand without a problem. Of course, you <laughs> cannot trade it li like that. Okay, but the idea of drastically reducing consumption, where should this idea come from? Because there's the concept of minimalism that is becoming more and more popular, but one of the critiques of minimalism is that you have to be quite wealthy to be able to afford minimalism because you don't buy things, but then you rent them, but for you to rent them, someone constantly has to have them on offer. So do we actually have a model that we could scale right now, or do we need a completely different model? Can we fix capitalism by these small steps of uh, consuming less and regulating more, or is there a completely new model that we don't know yet that we have to figure out how to get it to work? Uh, I think it's hard to speak about one model that we have. I mean, it's not like we have one constructed model which is called capitalism, which has certain rules that everyone follows. It's, it's more like a, a mixture of many different practices. So what we have is the sum of, of practices. But of course there are some systematic things about capitalism. It's very hard to start to say where to begin to change it, but, but I think we, we need to be aware. I think, for example, all the, all the techno fixes, you can just believe in new technology is going to save everything, that you don't have to change your lifestyle because the new technology will solve everything, or the, the circular economy will, will solve everything, or sharing economy will solve er everything. I mean, those are all different things that are promising us that we d do not need to change our lifestyles because uh, someone else is going to do it, some new system is going to do it. But I think we all need to realize that all of us need to change. We cannot go on like we do, even if we invent circular economy, even if we, we invent new technologies. We, we need to limit ourselves in some way. And once we realize that, I think everyone is, has to be an actor. We cannot just point at, oh, those companies need to change or those politicians need to do something. We all need to engage in this. I think. This is the only way. Mm -hmm. Christian, when talking about companies, are they more just going slow step-by-step -step changes, or do you see that the company representatives are like, let's radically change the way we sell, the way we produce things, or is it more of a slow process? Well, it's very different. Uh, I know one Estonian company uh, who said it's been a 20-year journey. But uh, once the, the guy started the company, he couldn't do it any other way, so he decided whether it will take a long time, it doesn't matter. And then for others, when they innovate suddenly, uh, they can go very fast. And, and others, they can just go on uh, for years, like talking to people, can you give me ideas? Um, and I've seen, wanted to add one, one thing to this uh, other question as well. I, I have many friends who have, uh, during their life, turned to a natural lifestyle. Uh, just changed their lives, uh, and, and also managers who have changed their own personal lives. And then one of the first things they start thinking, okay, uh, where should I put my children to school? And they start considering maybe Waldorf schools, or where is this environment where my child can grow to cooperate and, and, and build based on natural life? Uh, and that's why I wanted to comment that maybe education system is still where we should look because mm -hmm. there we grow up and we, we learn what natural life is and what consumption is. Uh, but that's not, of course, uh, the answer to everyone. Just 
of course, as, as a experience. teacher, uh, it's always interesting to listen that the education <laughs> system should fix everything. <laughs> um, but before we get to practical solutions, so to kind of set the marker, if we continue as we are going, what is this worst possible scenario? Where will we end up? What, what will be the issue? Will we end up with wars? Will we end up with a ruined planet? What, what is the destination we are heading towards right now? Uh, Mika, how about you? Uh, I, I think that rich countries will survive anyway. I, I think, for instance, Estonia, we have been traveling here for a few days, and you have a lot of forest here, a lot of space, and the weather is almost always nice. <laughs> So, so rich countries, but then, then what's happening in, for instance, in Spain, it is sort of estimated that in Barcelona, Madrid area, there is kind of coming like Sahara area. Those people are moving up to north and what's happening in north and what is this kind of political things, how we react that millions of people are coming to Estonia, Finland, Sweden. I don't know, but, but it's, I'm still sure that, that this, these biggest problems are poor people in poor countries. Mm? Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, um, I uh, mm, perhaps I'm not the right person to to describe the worst case scenario. Of course, mm, it's my. I mean, uh, things won't improve, <laughs> but rather the vice versa. But uh, I would like to stress that uh, uh, that uh, building scenarios is actually very important uh, because then you wouldn't be locked in only in one kind of thinking. Uh, there is massive evidence that uh, things have gone uh, worse uh, since the Second World War, that uh, together with the economic growth, also the negative consequences, uh, environmental pressure, pollution, etc., that um, they have grown hand in hand. But uh, uh, we should not forget uh, other scenarios. And, uh, for example, for OECD countries, uh, there is evidence that the decoupling is, is happening. So what do I mean by that? It means that uh, the economic growth and the environmental pressure don't grow hand in hand anymore. So that, of course, the pressure grows too, the greenhouse gases, for example, but at a much slower pace than the GDP. So in rich countries, um, uh, in industrial countries, actually the, the decoupling is happening um, silently and slowly, but still. But of course, uh, the emerging countries, uh, the, the still low-income countries, well, if we are talking about reducing consumptions, consumption, there are about uh, three to four billion people who haven't started to consume at all uh, in our terms, in our terms of thinking. And one billion among them living in extreme poverty. So if we were uh, previously uh, searching for whom to blame in the, in the uh, current situation, where have, we uh, where have we come, then one of the, um, one of the guilty ones probably is uh, poverty. If people are very poor, so they struggle to survive and they don't really care um, about uh, pollution, about uh, the well good stance of of of, uh, of nature around them so they really try to find something to eat this um, uh, this night and uh, mm, as long as there is extreme poverty and uh, it is it comes uh, uh, hand in hand with uh, um, corruption and uh, uh, the administrations uh, selling off the natural resources at very low prices. As long as we do have this situation, uh, we cannot uh, claim them to reduce uh, their consumption. That would be absurd. So there is still uh, the growth is needed uh, to help these very poor countries, very poorly living people, out of the misery, and then we can uh, start to uh, to um, uh, to think uh, to think and talk about uh, um, reducing consumption globally. As long as this hasn't happened, this reduction in consumption can only um, be about uh, about us, the rich countries, the OECD countries, the industrial countries. And uh, if we do the calculus about the impacts uh, um, on, on environment, on economy, if we do take into account this 
subset of, of, uh, of people who, um, uh, who still want to consume, who need to consume to, to improve um, their living standards to a normal level. So we have to take this into account and the calculus then looks a little bit different. Uh, Mikael, you mentioned when we were talking before that you ran scenarios for a, a, a no growth economic model. Mm -hmm. uh, well, first, could you explain a bit wh what it looks like and what was the reception for uh, such models? So we had four different scenarios and, and the basic, th what they had in common was that the economy of Sweden wasn't growing, but it was staying somewhere where we are now, or some of them went a little bit back. And they were quite different. One was uh, an automation scenario where we had more, uh, very much uh, digital digitalization and, uh, and artificial intelligence and robots and things like that. And people don't have to work, so instead of working and creating new jobs and producing and consuming, basically the robots did everything and people just relaxed. And in, in one of the other scenarios was quite different. It was more like people moving back into the countrysides, living frugal lives, but consuming less and so on. So it was very different scenarios, four different. We had one called the circular economy and one collaborative economy. So they were very different. Uh, I think some people reacted very negatively. They thought that we were, we were um, looking backwards. We were actually uh, negotiating the future people's, their welfare and so on. But I think they did not read the scenarios. Uh, but most people were very happy. I think the people that we met, which is of course not the representative. Um, I mean, some people who like like it come and talk to us, and they, then those are the people we met. But I think many people actually long for something else. People are more or less desperate because the system seems to be unable to change. There is some kind of idea that without growth, everything will collapse. The economy will collapse, and I think we we show that this does not need to happen. We can actually have uh, an economy that is working without growth. We can have production and consumption which goes on at a steady state. We, it doesn't have to grow. It's not, it's not like that. And the reason why, why we think that the economy has to grow is that in the few short periods where the economy did not grow the last 200 years, it was during economic crisis. But the reason wasn't that the economy was growing. The reason was that there was something else wrong in the economy. People were going to debt. There were uh, different problems in the economy which made uh, financial crisis and debt crisis and then afterwards it also had a result on growth but the lack of growth wasn't the reason for the problems it was the other way around I think mm -hmm. so I think if in the long term it's it's not a problem to have an economy that doesn't grow mm -hmm. but may I ask um, uh, does it uh, assume a stable population no gr no growth uh, it yeah I mean that it basically it was a per capita Mm -hmm. Calculation. So, so we had a, we had a, a population scenario where the Swedish population would increase a little bit because we assumed some migration, but mm -hmm. not so much. But and mm -hmm. also reducing working hours. Uh, in in two of the scenarios, the, the or yeah, but mm -hmm. in in some of the scenarios we still kept working. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it was a different, two different. Uh, might I ask a question from? The uh, take the microphone. Right. Uh, my name is Hans, I'm a publisher. I'd like to, to, to ask a question from you. Uh, uh, do you have polit political representation in, uh, in Sweden to those ideas? Uh, it reminds me very, very, very much of what I've heard at the Venstre meetings. So it's, it's not uh, uncommon in Sweden to, to hear those ideas about uh, not less money in the economy, less circulation, some more pressure to the banks. But those those are communist ideas. We we don't have a, <laughs> a we we miss a left left wing uh, uh, party in this country here. Mm -hmm. We we do have a right wing as we don't have left wing. But you have. Does it sound sound a bell with them? Uh, I mean, we have a left wing party and we have a green party. But I think most of them find it quite inconvenient to speak about these things. They want they don't want to say, say to the voters that they should. But there are a few parliamentarists uh, saying those things. So, I mean, the ideas are, are, are there in, in those two parties. And actually, a few people in the, in the Social Democratic Party as well. Okay, two questions. Once you, and then send the microphone back. Uh, I'd like to say a comment. Uh, uh, it's about uh, this uh, possibility to, to minimize or, or make uh, less the consumption uh, uh, level. Uh, there is uh, one uh, pure physical uh, basic law it calls uh, maximum uh, power, uh, maximum energy uh, principle, and uh, in, in basics, it, it is. If you if you if you look at uh, uh, Darwinism, it means that uh, this uh, uh, 
living thing who gets more from environment and uh, lets from other side more uh, to environment will win uh, competition and this is thing what is very difficult to to get out from from any living thing uh, and uh, from uh, man and and the second second thing is uh, only this period of very fast economic growth had uh, made possible to us to avoid uh, wars it seems like this so uh, maybe the solution is big war how do you explain it for Estonian government? Or, or <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I wouldn't advoca advocate for a war, but it seems to me as well that growth is uh, similar to oil shale. Uh, to Estonians, oil shale is a very known phenomenon. It's similar to oil shale, we can't live with it and we can't live without it. So it's, it's a paradox or, or it's a blessing and a doom at the same time. So. Um, to that point, yes, I, 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 I agree with you. Uh, and uh, I have the same mixed feelings about uh, these uh, no-growth uh, ideas. Uh, and uh, I've seen a simulation done in Canadian government. And they did a little bit like uh, you were talking about, uh, but in, uh, in quantitative terms. Uh, they took a, a big uh, uh, governmental fiscal model uh, full of, of fiscal data and, and data about the economy, growth, employment, uh, uh, poverty, things like that. And uh, they tried to find such a uh, combination uh, uh, that uh, growth would be low, uh, leveling out uh, uh, in some years uh, totally, but at the same time to have low unemployment, to have low poverty, to have uh, uh, decent fiscal revenues uh, and uh, low uh, greenhouse gas em emissions. And they did find actually th such a combination, such a sim simulation. It came out of this uh, um, computer full of uh, accurate uh, real-time, not, not, not real-time, but, uh, but um, uh, recent data. And um, but, uh, the but is that they did have uh, uh, quite a set of assumptions uh, to arrive at this uh, uh, very good uh, kind of promising uh, outlook. Uh, first was that um, uh, the consumption shifted. Of course, it was decreased, and, and it also shifted to public goods, including environment. Uh, so it, uh, uh, there, were, there was more consumption of services than of physical goods. And renting, not owning, was one of the principles. Uh, reuse, of course, so it also um, implies that the, the things have to be uh, made and built to long last. Uh, sharing, different kind of forms of sharing of, of, uh, of physical goods. Uh, and uh, investment in this model shifted into clean techs. Um, and uh, of course, pricing of the externalities, pricing of the pollution, pricing of the, um, uh, of the greenhouse gases and other damaging uh, social and env environmental e effects. Uh, and they also say that um, in order to invest, at least in, in order to invest public money into something, you need to assess uh, the potential social and env environmental consequences uh, uh, in the first place. And, and without this, uh, you can't get the approval for funding. And uh, employment shifted into services, working hours were reduced, uh, and um, the reasoning was that well-being enhanced more by extra leisure time than by extra income. Of course, it might be valid for, for Canada, a rich country like Canada. And what else? And population was held constant. So they was, uh, the, the model, in, or in order to uh, produce the, the good outlook, uh, it uh, um, uh, required limiting immigration, so to keep the population constant. Under these circumstances that I just uh, uh, named, uh, it was possible to achieve um, uh, a no growth or a very low or no growth, and then without, the raise, without raising unemployment and, and uh, drastically uh, increased uh, poverty rate. Okay, we have a question at the back. Yes, hello. Um, thank you for being here today. It's rare that we come across such a skilled and well-informed uh, panel. Um, I had a question. The, the premise for you being here today is that never-ending growth seems unrealistic. Uh, yet we do have nations and private entities who are ramping up uh, the space race again. We're seeing China, India, 
and the American entities who want to terraform Mars. There's talks about putting a, a permanent moon base up there. Uh, have you considered that nations who do not partake in this space race, who willingly put themselves in the, in the back seat of forming humanity, will have a very poor negotiation position if these nations were to succeed with ever, ever uh, continuing growth? Very good question. If we run out of resources on this planet, should we take the next? I think that's completely unrealistic. I mean, I think we need r resources to go there. We need energy, energy to go there. So. In a countryside in Finland, you cannot survive without car. So, and, and this explains why these true Finns have been so good, because many people think that, that their life is coming and sort of not possible at all. And, and this is very, very important to think what is the fair, fairness in taxing. Uh, one idea for taxing that I've heard is to tax technology, robots, AI, that one of the solutions that gets offered out is that we uh, automatize everything. We have robots, AI that take over and we tax that. Could that be a solution? We did that in one of our scenarios, just to say that. So, uh, Did it work? <laughs> in the scenario it worked. <laughs> <laughs> but we were assuming that the robots were sustainable and, and we don't know the technology. Uh, how we can do that? I mean, yeah, we're just assuming yeah. that. Yeah. Indeed, basically, it's uh, taxing the, the technology is related to taxing the robots is, is related to preserving jobs and and uh, um, mm, um, not letting uh, unemployment to grow uh, because of automation. So uh, it's it's a little bit different uh, different story than uh, uh, than improving the the um, environment. Um, I would say that uh, the external externalities needs to be taxed more. Uh, the carbon price is a step into the right direc direction, and uh, there's mm, perhaps other mm, potential ideas that uh, that uh, mm, would uh, make the investors, uh, the the businessmen, to think twice uh, if they are taking some uh, polluting or environmentally damaging action. So uh, the tax needs to be di directed into into these uh, into these areas, but uh, uh, taxes and subsidies uh, indeed need to work uh, hand in hand. And uh, again, it's my personal feeling uh, that uh, in order for the green policies to be successful, they need to be a little bit red green, uh, so that uh, the ones who uh, are herded uh, by by the green policies, uh, because uh, um, the low income people um, will be if things are taxed, uh, so it, the life gets more expensive and they lose out more than the, the ones who are in, in a better stance and better off. So um, mm, there should be some kind of uh, redistribution, as Mikael was just mentioning uh, before, or, or then designing of, uh, of, uh, of the taxes and prices the way that it would not hurt as much uh, the low-income people and, and the burden would be carried most by the, by the high-income ones. Mm. Okay, there's, yeah, there's several comments, so send the microphone around and at the back as well. Taxing technology is very reasonable considering that human workforce is taxed and considering that currently technology-based workforce is kind of subsidized, even if maybe the t quality and everything is worse, it's uh, still cheaper due to taxes. So. And the second thing is, of course, then everybody says that taxing robots is very difficult because when uh, we have uh, some robot working and then one which is doing the job of 10 people and then we hire one person, we can say that well, we still have people and it's not the robot doing the work. But instead, it's, it would be much simpler simply to eradicate the uh, human tax and increase the value-added tax until every consumption is taxed similarly, so there is no additional bureaucracy with robot taxes. And robots are taxed, human workforce is taxed, every, every, every production method is taxed similarly. And we replace humans with robots only when they produce cheaper or better quality work than humans do which currently is not true always. Robots might, might produce currently cheaper, uh, cheaper because they are 
less tax tax uh, weight on them, but they don't produce better quality or uh, they don't improve the econo economy. Thanks. One problem with fl with VAT taxes is, is that will be regressive. It will it will hurt the poor most because mm -hmm. they spend more. I mean. It's no, I, uh, I'm sure something can be invented regarding yeah. you can introduce VAT for companies. Well, it's not really okay. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's a big well, discussion. Yeah, no taxes. For, there are different ways. There was uh, some questions in the back. Can we send the microphone there? Hello. Um, my question is: You talked about it briefly before, um, but I would like a more analyzed answer. Um, there are about half of the world who hasn't reached the level that we have reached right now. Um, we have a good economy, people are relatively healthy and wealthy, um, but China, the continent of Africa, Saudi Arabia, these countries are not thinking the way that we are thinking about the world right now. There maybe the priorities of the people who are living in the country are not the same. So my question is, politically, even the US who is on the same level economically as we are, even better, are not thinking about the economy because of the political decisions that they made. The president is not in, they're not thinking about uh, basically the world health, they're thinking about their own uh, wealth. So my question is, what would it take for the rest of the world to follow lead? Because basically right now what we're talking about is Europe is thinking about the, uh, the, the world health and all the other countries are still thinking about their own development. So what would it take? New leaders. <laughs> How do we get, where do we get those new leaders? Again, I think, I mean, how do you change people's minds? I think there is, it's a very difficult question, uh, but at least one clue could be a fair distribution. I mean, we're the richest, we're on top, and we're, we're talking about the ecology. I mean, if we could be more equal, then maybe we could. I mean, it seems like first everyone wants to reach our level of consumption and level, level of welfare and then they can start thinking about the environment. I'm not saying that they're not thinking because there are people in, in every country thinking about these things but, but the policies are not implemented in such Was a way. So I think... Yeah. If you're talking about distribution, do you mean that the wealthier countries should give some of their money to the poorer countries? Because if we're talking about China, they're not poor, they just... the priorities are different. Mm -hmm. So well what, are you, do you, what do you mean by distribution? Well, actually, uh, so, sorry to intervene, but perhaps my uh, former comment about China was not audible, so there was no electricity. Uh, s but uh, uh, in fact, in, s in China, people are more and more climate-minded. So there's a social pressure towards their uh, uh, administration to, to, uh, to invest into clean tech and to improve the, the situation as they really do have a very low quality air in quite uh, many uh, big cities. I, I want to repeat that it's a very difficult question, and I, know, I, I don't know how to do, how to redistribute the world economy. But but one thing we can think of is to limit ourselves. We we who are have everything, we ha we who are, who are so affluent, maybe could stop growing at least. We, maybe we not don't have to follow the growth path and be more and more rich, because the richer we get, the the more everyone else will want. So I mean, at least we should stop where we are, or maybe limit ourselves a bit exactly how we, how we do that politically, I don't know, but I think something, amo something among those lines, Europe I think. Europe has uh, effic efficiently stopped the economies for the last uh, seven years. We are stagnating. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> 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 okay, there's a question <laughs> at the back. <laughs> yeah, so, so you mentioned... <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry, there's a question at the back. Uh, you mentioned that uh, many of your models assume things such that technology uh, is sustainable, assumably, somehow. So, so we can assume a lot of things about the future, some of them more uh, concretely than others. So we can assume that we will have climate breakdown, quite surely. We can assume that uh, peak oil has already been passed. And um, uh, we can also assume 
uh, something third that I don't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> but the problem is that th this climate breakdown will be this big war that was mentioned. Uh, and now the question before was like, which, w which survives, right? These low-tech solutions that are very robust or these high-tech, super nanotech solutions that really depend on this whole system that is coming down. So we don't know, we will see. Uh, but I think the, the good thing is that there should be a multiple options available. So not everyone should do this uh, space race, I think. I absolutely agree that it is uh, the matter uh, about uh, having a reasonable portfolio of different options. But there was another another question. Ah, okay. <laughs> well, um, um, in fact, um, if if we are again talking about uh, limiting growth and staying at the level where we are, um, as I said, it might be reasonable for us, the rich club, but, but not yet for, for, for the poor ones. And we have to really accept this and acknowledge this. Um, and the growth, paradoxically, can also be a vehicle to improve the environment because um, uh, given that the investment goes into the right place, given that the stimulus for environmental friendly, for clean tech investment is uh, high enough and, uh, and uh, the adoption is wide enough, uh, wide enough so we could really see um, the falling prices because at the end of the day everything comes down to the price, to the price of things. And uh, if we do see falling prices of um, clean technologies, uh, then this is part of the solution and not part of the problem. And this has happened, for example, in case of solar energy. Uh, and um, mm, mm, so my point is that we shouldn't see growth uh, as uh, an evil in itself, but rather it has various aspects. And if we want affordable, environmental friendly goods and services, affordable clean tech, then we need to have a bit growth to work as a stimulus for investments. But of course, um, uh, uh, then at, at the other hand, today what we are seeing is that massive investment is still growing into the old technologies, into dirty technologies, including public investment. There are still huge subsidies to, uh, to conventional oils and to fossil fuels and uh, big money going into exploration for new sources of, 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 um, uh, uh, of oil. So uh, we should at least remove the subsidies and the public funding from that sector. We cannot really ban uh, the private investors to go there, but at least we should uh, we'll take off the public funding uh, from, from this and channel it to the clean tech and en environmental technologies. Okay, uh, question. So, so is it that, uh, for example, the government should decide what kind of business sector could grow for example, if, if it grows for good purposes, uh, mm -hmm. uh, clean tech, environmental technologies, then uh, you, you, you can grow it, right? But you produce uh, some random stuff, maybe you should not grow. I mean, Okay, we are back at the need, uh, need for di dictatorship, right? <laughs> yeah, so the question was, should the <laughs> government dictate which businesses <laughs> get to that, develop? Yeah. Well, but ra mm. rather uh, say that, should government take more proactive role in really regulating what's going on mm -hmm. in, in the economy. Because, uh, of course, now yeah, definitely. Really, definitely. Uh, I'm in favor. I'm in favor of smart regulation. I'm really in favor of smart regulation. Of course, uh, there's this famous saying of Adam Smith uh, that uh, the, uh, you shouldn't really uh, get. Uh, you shouldn't really. Um, you should let the invisible hand to work. So uh, everyone's pursuing his or her selfish interests, and at the end of the day, we are all better off. But it was uh, uh, more than 100 years ago. And indeed, 200 years ago. <laughs> and it has uh, proven, uh, I mean, the, the, um, um, we are all convinced now that in order for the invisible hand to work well, a lot of very visible efforts by the governments are actually needed. So, so without setting the rules of the playground, uh, you cannot expect uh, uh, a good result. Okay, so since we have about 10 minutes left in the debate, now we're going to make a list of all the things that we are going to improve. So we have the three components in the discussion. We have the consumers, we have the businesses, and we have the government. So for the government, we have had a lot of ideas. So subsidies, taxes, smart policies. What differentiates smart policies from regular policies? How do the governments need to uh, 
uh, plan for this regulation? Do they need to use more foresight information, more scientific data? Why are we not getting these proper policy decisions uh, right now? At least in Finland, we do not lack information or data or science. We lack uh, kind of willpower. What to, to make, for instance, these subsidize, these stupid subsidize. I don't know whether it's stupid, but it's energy, uh, uh, from energy point of view, quite stupid it is. In Finland, when we're discussing concretely, for instance, Finnish state is putting 200 millions each year for this. Uh, uh, shipping companies who are, are m making trips from Helsinki to Tallinn and from Helsinki to Stockholm, 200 millions just to support these shipping companies. And it's, uh, it's, it's, but it's, it has been very difficult to sort of, uh, in political discussion, to change these kind of things. I, I think we need more concrete cases, concrete discussion, more, less about this kind of generally, because generally we are all, all quite uh, in agreement. And, and this, these are concre concrete things, and there is no easy solution. And this kind of putting 200 billions, 200 millions for these shipping companies, it's so strange that pe Finnish people could drink alcoholic uh, uh, b b without these paying taxes. In I don't understand that, mm -hmm. even if I came by boat. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I actually, I'm going to buy some wine. <laughs> Okay, uh, Mikael, uh, sa same question. Uh, do you agree that we have all the science and we have all the data, we are just lacking conviction? Yeah, more or less I agree with that, yeah. So I think, uh, I, I mean, w what we don't really agree on, I think, m maybe we do here more or less, but I think, I think uh, people are too, p too optimistic uh, towards technology, towards techno fixes and, and so on, and, and they don't want to see sufficiency they don't want to see policies reducing consumption because they think it's not needed i think we need to educate ourselves We're there we don't have enough knowledge i think it's completely unsustainable to keep growing our rates of consumption and production never mind if it's green consumption green growth we can't have it forever we need to limit ourselves anyway and that's i think is not not everyone agrees on that not everyone even understands it and i think that's a problem there where, there we need to educate ourselves but, but, I mean, in many other areas, I think we know, but we need to act. Mm. Christina, would companies uh, welcome uh, more regulation and, and more direction from no. the government? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, but uh, I believe that was true that in Sweden, for instance, government uh, has reduced taxes for those companies who build their companies based on the idea of repairing something. So I, I, mm -hmm. I think yes. that this is a great way to go, mm -hmm. that you, you help these companies. In France, to they have the same. Mm -hmm. To fly. And this is, I think, great. And the other thing is that uh, I've seen the development in Estonia regarding sustainable uh, issues. Mm -hmm. And I find that I still advocate of human factor in everything. Uh, I think it takes strong leadership and speaking out and a strong will. Mm -hmm. And you can change so many people around you. Uh, and, and explaining, of course, what is systematic thinking and what sustainability actually is. This is very important point. Uh, I have had discussions with hundreds of people during these years, and you have no idea how many people actually don't get what sustainability is. And, is and they advocate <laughs> it. Uh, and this is very, very important thing on the, on the government level as well, that this, uh, whoever is serving the state, whoever is running the company, gets the point. Uh, gets the thing that it, it has to consider all the decisions within the context that the system becomes aware of itself. Uh, I think this is like the core of, of, of all the sustainable development. And then somebody should speak out and uh, ignite everybody else. Greta's, Greta Thunberg's uh, example is really good. I think uh, she has ignited. She's a child and she has a very strong voice. Uh, I, th I think she plays a great part why many Estonian businessmen have started actually considering thinking about the topic. Because somebody speaks up so uh, with a, such a strong voice that you need to start. If you don't understand, uh, you're not popular anymore. So you need to start thinking, you're forced to think. Uh, so the question of these policies that we need the politicians to enact them. So the question was, can we change capitalism or we need something new? Can we change the way current politicians think and the policies they enact? Or do we need a whole new generation of politicians who are more aware, more interested, have a louder voice? 
So young people are always revolutionary, and then they grow up and they become like us. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think we we cannot wait until the next generation. We don't have that time, so we mm. can just hope that we we can we can under we can uh, change the mm. living. I mean, we have to. Well, politicians to react to the to the requests and demands they get from their electorate, and we are the electorate. So this is basically up to us and uh, to 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 uh, bring these ideas into the politics. And um, of course, I'm not uh, optimistic that uh, it can be happen quickly and and thoroughly. But uh, that's that's basically about the values of of the people of the electorate and uh, and how they are convened into the political programs. So we shouldn't blame the politicians; they actually uh, react to what we are talking them, talk, talking to them. And we, I mean, not only us here and now today in Paide, but uh, but. Um, the people in the country. Mm. Okay, but we focused a lot on, on the consumer part, what people consume and how the government could regulate, but maybe it should be the businesses, the companies themselves that take the lead because the biggest corporations in the world, they have far more power than a lot of individual uh, nation states. So maybe they're the ones that That's should start that the change. That is also a big problem. Uh, that it actually is uh, very often like this, but I think both should take power. Uh, politicians do, should understand their role, uh, business sh businesses should understand their role and equally take power in this question. So that uh, when I came to work in my position, I also saw many debates like who should be first? State, state should be first, no company should be first. State should lead the example. Mm -hmm. both, should, both, both should lead uh, the example because both are powerful uh, entities and, and they should cooperate and form alliances and form alliances with NGOs uh, and, and understand the whole one unit, the state. And then we, uh, we actually uh, probably get the results. Mm -hmm. You said question. the consumers change very slowly. Do the businesses change quicker? Yeah, for sure. That's for sure. But I, I think the, for the consumer point of view, in Holland there is a bit unorthodox foundation which is called uh, eternally yours. And the foundation idea is that, that whenever we are destroying the planet, we should enjoy anyway uh, uh, driving a Mercedes-Benz or something like that. And I think it's a quite interesting unorthodox idea that we, we should uh, try to appreciate what we have. We have warm water, we have all these nice things and not saying that it's so terrible. And then maybe saving planet by sort of uh, stressing some... The side effects. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, we have a question mm -hmm. from the back and then from the front. Um, so, thank you very much. Uh, I assume all of you think that our planet is in crisis at the moment and that we need to do something about it. Um, so, if we look at oil companies or coal companies, they will tell you, no, there's no problem with oil, there's no problem with coal, don't worry. It's very concrete. Greta Thunberg, she's very concrete. She's saying we have to change everything or we're in a big trouble. But when we get older, more boring, we become very academic and we start to talk about this as, and it's going like this and such. So this is a 75 minute discussion. You've talked for 70 minutes about, okay, this is the situation. So I would ask you, so there are a lot of things we can do concretely. We could tax palm oil, we could subsidize um, solar, we could uh, do something regulation why is with regards to companies? We could vote for the Greens. Who knows? Maybe they're not good. We could establish a new party. What concrete actions do you think that as private people or as companies or as countries that we need to do? So not academic, but what is like your suggestion? This is a good idea. Uh, well, okay, there's an answer <laughs> probably <laughs> in the audience. My, my answer is that the next uh, discussion here will be on practical solutions. Yes, next discussion will actually test the models and the yes, but there's a question at the back and then we'll get to the front. Uh, yeah, hi, uh, my name is Carl. I might have a, one of the solutions. So everyone who's here, if you're the customer of SD Energia, go to the SD Energia webpage and click on the green energy uh, tick mark. So you'll be consuming green energy because right now it's about one to two percent of their clients that are consuming green energy if we get it over 25 or 27 which is the green energy uh, production rate today then they have to start building more uh, more uh, I don't know windmills or solar panels 
So that's one thing they can do today. If you go and see if you're a green energy uh, consumer or not, if you click that button, that will make the day better and we'll keep on saving the environment. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, give the microphone to the front man in green. Uh, I would encourage about uh, value add added, added tax uh, once more. I thought about your comment and I have two responses. First, I think that replacing, not increasing value added tax, but replacing human workforce with uh, tax with value added tax is not so regressive because human workforce will be val valued higher. People will be re uh, replaced by robots less often, so they, are, they have more jobs, they will get higher salaries, and of course when people lose jobs or get low salaries, then it affects poor people first. That's the first consideration. Second thing is of course that value-added tax is the end consumer tax, which means you can always measure who is doing the consumption. If it's poor person, we can reduce the value added tax for this par particular person, or maybe we can uh, pay some of the expenses back by state, something like that, for example. Okay, so the very last round of questions for everyone, a moment for you to think. Um, oh, yes, I forgot a question. Uh, the mic yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, you're hiding behind me. <laughs> Oh, sorry, that's the palm, I know, yes. Um, if we're talking, and I presume we are talking about the environmental crisis, we're talking about uh, limited resources worldwide, not only here. Here in Estonia, we don't have that problem of overpopulation. And I'm very interested, I'm probably one of the oldest in this tent today, uh, I remember way back in 1960s, the whole question of world population, it was known as uh, the population explosion. It, we cannot continue living like that. Here we are, f half a century later, and still talking about it. Um, one of the, in it's an institutional problem. It's not so much, it's economic too, but institutional. What concerns me is this relationship, how in sociologically, men and women, um, and religious institutions, how they teach what a role of woman is. And uh, when I think of some African countries where, where, uh, where a woman uh, uh, gives birth at an average of five in her lifetime. Seven. Seven, well, it's got even bigger. Now, multiply that every generation it's it's not sustainable. And this is what we're talking about here in Estonia. We don't have that problem. That's not our government's problem. It's, it's those institutions who teach this kind of philosophy. So the, question, the question is... No, question is, what are we going to do about it? Population explosion is a real serious problem. And so how do we handle that with these very traditional institutions who don't want to hear about it? So it's w we need probably to, to handle it, but if you look at the environmental footprint of the 10% richest per people, 10% richest mm -hmm. part of the population, it's way more important than the 50% poorest. So I think still the biggest problem is overconsumption. That is a smaller problem. Well, it is, but I'm also talking about if they want to be rich, I mean, they want to become rich to become those consumers. Mm -hmm. It's not possible. Also, the other term I remember back from the United States was philanthropy fatigue. We cannot forever keep on feeding the poor. Mm. <coughs> well, in fact, there uh, are also some rosier uh, projections of population uh, growth uh, in the world. Uh, according to the UN forecasts, uh, the population will stabilize by the end of this century around 10 to 11 billion people. Yeah. 
uh, but it will stabilize. The good news is it will stabilize because the uh, the birth rates are uh, uh, are declining um, uh, practically in every country. Of course, the sub-Saharan Africa is is an issue, and uh, the decline hasn't yet uh, reached there. But uh, slowly, but, uh, but and surely, it, it will. Uh, it is uh, it is a matter of uh, education. It is a matter of uh, of birth control. It is a matter of economic development. Actually, at the first place. So uh, and child mortality, of course. If if uh, uh, if you know that all your children survive, you don't uh, give birth to so many of them. Um, you do because uh, you are afraid that some of them might not uh, uh, survive uh, until the age of working. So they won't be useful for you economically. So uh, this is a vicious circle there, but it's it's gonna be uh, broken, I'm sure, because it has been broken in so many developing uh, countries uh, before Sub-Saharan Africa. So um, there is good news actually in terms of population, but uh, there's still gonna be four billion, uh, three to four billion more than there is today. So the issue is definitely there. Okay, last question. Um, Christy, I would actually like to ask you, yes. uh, you as an investor, uh, entrepreneur, <laughs> given all this that we have heard today, uh, where would you invest in the future? Still where the money is. <laughs> ah, there you go. Sad, yeah. yeah. Sadly, th this is the idea. This is the, why I was so interested in this discussion as well, because as an investor, I would like to support sustainable investments. Now, the problem is, um, how do we get those sustainable investments to actually make money? The idea that something returns, because if it doesn't bring money, then it's called subsidies or charity. And yeah. people can, of La course, do that I, as well. I, I looked at uh, some sustainable companies index uh, fund. Uh, it was not doing good at all. Yeah, and I looked at a uh, sustainable company index fund that had, for example, Nestle included in the list. So our idea of what sustainable investing or what sustainable companies are is quite vague in that sense. Okay, but the very last question for each and every one of you. So now you can dream big. It can be as radical, as extremist as you want. And my question is, what would be the one thing, the one change, the one law or tax or, or changing consumer behavior that we should enact instantly that would truly help us towards a future that's more sustainable? The oh, one change. Okay, I, I can start just uh, quoting those politicians who uh, are uh, giving promise to restrict our own behavior. So I'm, I'm voting only politicians who say that w people like me should restrict their behavior in energy things. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, um, mm, yeah, if I could, I would uh, uh, take all the public funding out of the, the, uh, the dirty technologies, out of the uh, conventional fools and channel them to, to the clean tech and to the um, to uh, improving the, the or making up the environmental degradation. Um, yes, if mm -hmm. just the one thing, then this would it. Okay, Christina. Enlighten all the governments about sustainability and uh, and about uh, the importance of every decision in public procurement and and all the state decisions. <laughs> what does it actually mean to think about uh, what comes after your decision? And, and then uh, unite uh, all the forces to give adequate uh, analysis to these decisions. Mm -hmm. That would be great. Mm -hmm. I would put a cap on uh, things like carbon dioxide. I would just say the from, and then I would put a date, and I would put the, put the path. So let's say in 2030 we should be fossil free. Uh, and what can we do? under that cap, uh, and I, I wouldn't limit myself to, to carbon dioxide, of course, I would everything that has an environmental pressure, I would try to calculate beforehand what can we allow ourselves, including imports, uh, and then I would regulate. So, And then I, I would just uh, try to, um, to see, okay, within that budget, what can we do? I mean, how can we solve transports, how can we solve housing, and how can we distribute it fairly? Because obviously some lifestyles will not fit into that. Uh, and then uh, I should try to. I mean, I'm, uh, if I could do just what I wanted, I would do that. And I'm sure no politicians uh, have that power.
Hmm? Okay, but uh, thank you to everyone to sharing your ideas. Thank you to all of you for your questions. Our experts, they won't run away, so if you want to talk to them, they will be here for a moment. And I hope you've got some great ideas on uh, sustainable thinking. Uh, you can decide later whether or not you will shower once a week or twice a week or <laughs> who are the politicians once that uh, you will uh, vote for to make sure that our economic models will be more future-proof. So thank you to everyone and let's have a round of applause for our speakers. Thank you.